we're going to be talking here over the next um, couple weeks about ecology. And you know, ecology is a pretty big science. It covers a lot of different areas. Um, when I was in graduate school and, and college, ecology was my emphasis. So that's what I studied a lot. And because that's what I was studying ecology, I just take classes about all different types of living things. Um, you know, a class about birds, a class about trees, a class about plants, a class about mammals, and so forth. And then also classes about things like um, water, hydrology, wetlands, um, soil science, things about the non-living parts of the world as well. And so um, ecology requires that because it's, ecology is looking at not only the living things in a specific area, but also the non-living components as well and how they all interact with each other. We know that living things rely on non-living things. We all need oxygen, we need water, we need nutrients and minerals. Those are non-living things, but still a very important part of, of the Earth as well. So that's what ecology is, studying living things and their environments. So what we're going to be doing is starting off by talking about sort of how we organize the world according to ecology, how we sort of categorize things. And I'll talk about how energy moves through the ecosystem and materials. I'll talk a little bit about environmental issues and things like that. So first off, when we study ecology, we're often talking about things called ecosystems. And an ecosystem is sort of a, a large area or a small area where you have a bunch of living organisms interacting with also non-living things. And some, are, some ecosystems are huge, like the ocean ecosystem, very big, or a desert ecosystem. But also we can think about small areas as an ecosystem as well. You could look at a, a puddle and the different types of tiny little plants and animals that live in it, or a, log, a rotting log has its own ecosystem. So it could be large or it could be small. We can think about this courtyard. I'll use this as an example today. This courtyard in our school, that's its, its own small ecosystem out there. It has a variety of living things, some important non-living factors as well. That's an ecosystem. And so when we think about an ecosystem, we kind of can split it into two parts, the community and the habitat. And when we talk about the community, what we're referring to are all of the various living organisms in that ecosystem. That's what we mean by the community. It's the living thing. Now you can imagine sort of the neighborhood you live in as an ecosystem. And all the people that live there in that neighborhood, they would be like the community. They're the residents of your neighborhood. So if I'm thinking about my courtyard ecosystem here again, um, the community would be the trees out there, the grass, the insects, the ducks that sometimes fly in there, the dandelions, the worms in the soil, all those different living things, the bacteria, fungi, all of those would be a part of that courtyard community. But then there's also the habitat. The habitat is sort of the area, the non-living parts of that ecosystem. So if I'm talking about the habitat of the courtyard, it's that central area. It includes the soil out there, rocks in the soil, air and water in the soil, all those sort of non-living parts are the habitat. And so just like in your neighborhood, the community would be like the people that live in there, the habitat would be like the buildings in your neighborhood. So. Community would be like the people that live in your neighborhood. The habitat would be like the actual buildings, the houses and stores and so forth. Does that make a change any friend? I don't 
we further break things down a little bit more, we're thinking about the courtyard community, all the living things out there. We can then talk about individual, what we call populations. Population is all of one specific species in an area. But it has to be one species only. So for example, if I'm thinking about a pond ecosystem, all of the bullfrogs living in that pond would be one population. All of the Asian carp living in that pond would be another population. What? But would it, if I said all the fish in the pond, would that be a population? No, that'd be diversity. Yeah, that would not be a population. Why not? If I say the fish in the pond, kill. Yeah, there's lots of different species. So if I'm talking about a population, I have to be specific. If I'm looking in the courtyard, I could say, what, can I say the trees in the courtyard? No. No. There's different types of trees. I could say the white pine trees yeah. in the courtyard, because that's a specific species. That's what that one, there's one white pine tree. I could talk about the cedar bush. I could talk about the birch tree. I could talk about the silver maple. I could talk about the dandelions or the male or ducks that sometimes live out there. Those are individual populations. But I have to be specific about one certain species. And then the last thing on the slide is diversity. When we talk about the diversity of something, we're talking about how many different things there are, how many different types of living things. Now, our courtyard ecosystem, it doesn't have a very big diversity. There's not that many different living things out there. Okay? Um, different ecosystems have different levels of diversity. It's how many different species there are in this community. What would be an ecosystem that you've heard of that has a high diversity? Rainforest. Yeah, the rainforest. Oh, the rain. I got to go to the rainforest last spring um, when we went to Costa Rica, and it's an ecosystem that has huge diversity, just <clears throat> many, many different plants and animal species living in a relatively small area. The tropical rainforest is one of the most diverse ecosystems um, there is. <clears throat> and when we think about an ecosystem, we can talk about the biotic and abiotic factors that are important to the ecosystem. What does the prefix bio mean? Life. That means life. Biotic factors are living things in the ecosystem. You know, if I think about the courtyard, I might think of all the grass that's living out there and the trees and um, the worms and the soil, the bacteria. Those are all living things. Those are biotic factors, living things. What does this prefix A do to a word? It means not. So what are abiotic factors? Not same. Not, not life. Not living. Non-living things. So in my courtyard, I would be the soil, the rocks, the water, the air, oxygen. Those would all be abiotic factors because they're not living. They're still important and they're still a part of the ecosystem, but they're non-living. Temperature is often an important abiotic factor that influences the ecosystem. Auto means self. We'll talk about that prefix in a minute. What about this rotting log? Raise your hand if you could tell me what, do you, what type of factor is it? Biotic or abiotic? Olivia? Hey, by that, because it's no longer living. How about these flowers? Yeah. Biotic. Rosie? Biotic. Rosie? Biotic. Biotic. They are living. How about the water here? Biotic. 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 And abiotic. Is water a living organism? No. Yes, it is abiotic. That's abiotic. It may contain living organisms in it, 
But the water itself is not I have a question. Okay. Yes, Sam? What are those, like, is that like the sex that I got at? Let's wait till the end, because right now we're in town. It's about animals, right? All right. So, ecosystems contain abiotic factors, biotic factors. They also <laughs> require energy. We know all the main things need energy. We need energy, plants need energy, bacteria need energy. What is the source of that energy? Yeah, the sun. The sun is important. So we know energy is one of the requirements of all living things. And on Earth, that energy for almost all ecosystems starts at the sun. The sun is the source of all energy. All food sources can be traced back to the sun. Even if somebody, like, say you just ate some uh, popcorn chicken or something. Did that energy you are consuming in that popcorn chicken come from the sun? Yes. Yes, yes it did. Yeah. The chicken was there. The chicken was there and it got killed. <laughs> the chicken, how's the chicken related to the sun? Well, I mean, it's, it's not real chicken, of course. But what's that? Is it required? Where does the chicken get energy? From grain, right? From me. Where does grain get its energy? From the sun. So you can trace all energy in all ecosystems, eventually back to the sun if you follow that pathway. So we have some terms for different types of organisms. The things that can use, the organisms that can use the sun's energy directly, we call producers. They use the sun's energy, and they use it to make their own food. Raise your hands if you can tell me what did we call that process when an organism can use the sun to make its own food. Samantha? Photosynthesis. Photosynthesis. And let's just have another quick review. Photosynthesis needs three things. It has three reactants, three things on the left side of the arrow when we're writing out the equation. What's one, one thing needed in photosynthesis, Sydney? Light. It needs light. Anthony? Um, water. Needs water, and it needs one other thing, Olivia? Carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. It then uses all of that to produce two things. What's one, Jake? C6H1206. Glucose, C6H1206. And what else? One last thing. What? Oh, oxygen. Oxygen, yes. Yeah. Lots of louder. So, producers use the sun's energy to produce food for themselves, to make glucose. We have another term. They're also called autotrophs. The prefix auto, do you know what it means? No. Like something is oh, automatic. It does it by itself. It work, does it by itself. If it's an autobiography, I wrote it myself. Auto means self. Troph means having to do with food or feeding. So self-feeding. Autotrophs make their own food. But only some organisms are producers. Only organisms with chloroplast and chlorophyll can actually use the sun's energy to make glucose. All other living things fall into this next category. They are what we call consumers. Consumers, they get their energy by eating other organisms. They can't make their own food. They need to eat other things in order to get the energy they need. So we are all consumers. We need to eat foods to get energy. All animals are consumers. Fungi are consumers. Most bacteria are consumers. Are we consumers? Yes. The other term for a consumer, it's still trope because it has to do with food. It's a heterotroph. It means other. So that's eat other things for food. Yeah. So we 
ecosystems are made of producers and consumers, and that's how energy moves through the ecosystem. We also have a category of organisms that we call decomposers. Raise your hand if you could tell me, what, is, what do decomposers do in the ecosystem? Oh. Sam? Maybe they split around the food, like, um, the, like, with, like, you know how like, the wind's putting on the flowers? Not quite. Not quite. Decomposers? Mia? They break down. Yeah, they break down dead <laughs> organisms. They break down waste material, organic matter. They break down those things and basically recycle the nutrients back into the ecosystem. You know, if a, a tree falls through okay, a, a thunderstorm and then it rocks, it's decomposers that are breaking it down. You know, usually things like bacteria, fungi are decomposers. As that log falls and is dying, decomposers return that nutrient from that tree back into the soil. So they're kind of like the recyclers of the ecosystem. consume insects. So your Venus flytrap has these two open pads. A fly flies in there, they close, and then the plant secretes enzymes and it breaks down the insides of that insect. And then eventually it absorbs those nutrients and then it opens back up and all that's left is just the exoskeleton because it can't break down the exoskeleton. So really like all the insides of that fly, the Venus flytrap absorb those for nutrients. Again, this relates to the next thing we're going to talk about, how energy flows through an ecosystem. Um, so when this fish is saying, darn, I don't like the green ones, he's yellowish. So why is he saying that if this is the green one? Small. No, because the one that the green one ate, I mean, no, the orange. Yes. All of these fish eventually end up in the top, we call that the top carnivore. In fact, this is actually relevant to, um, because sometimes have, um, toxic metals like mercury that get polluted into water, sometimes tiny little animals and plants absorb them. And even though there's only a small amount in each of these tiny little animals, they get eaten by a larger fish eats a whole bunch of them. And then a larger fish eats a bunch of those. And as you move up the food chain, the amount of these toxic substances increases. So those top carnivores end up getting a lot of these, this mercury in them. In fact, um, pregnant women um, are supposed to limit the amount of certain fishes that they eat, like tuna. Um, tuna is a, a big fish. It's a, a carnivore and it would be on one of these fish. And the amount of mercury that could be in tuna could be high, and that could be dangerous to a developing fetus. So sometimes people are advised not to eat um, huge amounts of certain types of fish, especially if they're pregnant. What if you eat an animal, you're not pregnant? You know, it's okay. I mean, if you ate a ton of tuna like day after day, then you can get sick with these metals because they build up. But it's most dangerous to you know, a developing fetus. So when we look at the flow of energy in a, an ecosystem, we can create something we call food chains, a type of diagram that shows us the flow of energy through the ecosystem. Because energy goes from one organism to another to another based on their feeding relationships. And a food chain is pretty simple. It's just kind of a straight line. One thing eats another thing, eats another thing, eats another thing. That's a food chain. It shows predator-prey relationships. The predator is the animal that eats the prey. So if 
I set up a simple food chain here, we always start in a food chain with what type of organism? Plant. A plant, yeah. a producer. We have to start with a producer that will capture the sun's energy. We don't usually include the sun in a food web because it's not a living thing, food chain. So let's say I have wheat plants growing. They absorb the sun's energy. They go through photosynthesis. They grow. And then let's say I have a mouse that eats the wheat. So the mouse eats the wheat, and it grows larger, uses that energy to survive. Then we have a snake that eats that mouse. And then we have an eagle that eats that snake. And this is how energy moves through the ecosystem, from one organism to another. The arrows are always showing the direction energy is going. So energy is going from the wheat to the mouse, from the mouse to the snake, snake to the eagle. What would we call the wheat? What's the term we just talked about? A producer. The wheat, in this example, is a producer. Everything else are called consumers, heterotrophs. Now, we often will number the consumers to tell us where they are in the food chain. So the mouse would be the first level consumer. And the thing that eats the mouse is the second level consumer. And the thing that eats the snake is the third level consumer, and so on. We don't number the wheat because it's not a consumer, it's a producer. All right, let me, so here, what would the mouse be in this food chain? Second level. Raise your hand. Kyle? Second level. Second level consumer. Why not third? Plant. Yeah, plant doesn't count. What is the plant? The producer. What's the eagle? Consumer. Level. Four. Four. First, second, third, fourth level consumer in this ecosystem. All right, any questions about food chain or the organization or ecosystem? We're going to stop there. I'm going to show you this brain top and then we'll move from there. I think we don't need to go to something that's going to be hot.